I'll get, I'll get um, going on my portion, which is the horticulture portion of this. And so um, really I am, you know, I'm a vegetable person. I'm the vegetable specialist for the University of Kentucky. And so, you know, the tomatoes, that was not uh, hard um, at all, but the flower portion was new for all of us. And so um, really just to give people a background, like what, what was this project all about? How did you even, you know, what was the reason behind this rotation? So one thing is many high tunnels are unused or underutilized, I would say in the fall after the tomatoes come out. So uh, typically, you know, spring to late summer, that's when tomato seasons, uh, especially high tunnel tomato season is going in Kentucky. So tunnels will could be or and often are full of tomatoes from at the very least sometime in April to August um, and after that um, growers do or could plant lettuce and other greens that would certainly suit um, our fall season but um, you know you see a lot of that you see a lot of that in markets um, around the state and so you know there could be a potential glut in the market um, which could drive prices down. Um, and then also just getting in, you know, flowers are high value. They could potentially be higher value than a lettuce or another greens crop. And so they're also non-related, not related to tomato um, with, as Alexis mentioned, relatively quick growing potential. So those days to maturity um, are fairly low. Um, especially compared to something like tomato, for example. So, um, and really that is important in trying to squeeze in a crop before frost or before um, things get really cold, as Alexis mentioned. So the other thing is that um, with high tunnels, there's no leaching, right? You've got a, a roof, a cover over the soil. And so um, there's often a lot of fertilizer applied in high tunnels. A lot of our growers treat high tunnels like open fields, um, but they don't have leaching. And so there is that buildup of fertilizer. And so could we potentially, the thought came about is put, potentially implement a crop um, post tomatoes that could take up those extra nutrients and the extra fertilizer. And, um, then of course, without rotation, as we all know, right, pests and diseases, diseases can get worse over time, right? And so thinking about a non, a not related crop that could rotate fairly smoothly with tomatoes that would break that pest, potential pest or disease cycle, right? So, and that, and you'll hear about that more after my talk. So here's the timeline. So for some people, this may be uh, confusing. We are talking about all this rotation happening in the same year, right? So the tomatoes were seeded in the greenhouse in February in Lexington. And so I'll say there, um, there were three sites, one in Lexington, which is where I'm in, in Fayette County. Um, uh, there were two tunnels, two tunnels in Breathitt County, which is kind of southeastern Kentucky, and then Boyle County, which is about an hour south of Fayette County. And that was where the grower, the commercial grower was. So the two, Lexington and Breathitt County, those are research tunnels, and then the other one's the commercial grower. So, and this, this timeline might be useful for people who in Kentucky who, you know, the difference between uh, Central Kentucky and Eastern Kentucky is, it is there, it's real. Um, so March 26th is when we transplanted in Lexington um, and in Breathitt County, they transplanted in April 3rd. So our first, um, our first tomato harvest oh, um, was June 20, June 18th, whereas their first tomato harvest was June 28th. So they were, even though they planted only a few days after us, but they were a solid 10 days um, after us with the first harvest. Um, let's see, flowers were seeded. So those of you thinking about, um, uh, you know, going into flowers, uh, you can look at when they were seeded and then when they were transplanted, right? So um, they were seeded July 30th. Um, during that time, we were still harvesting tomatoes. August 31st was our last harvest. Um, I think Breathitt County's was right around there too, maybe uh, about a week 
before us, they stopped. And then, so they transplanted the flowers September 3rd in Breathitt County and um, Lexington, and also Boyle County was about on par with all of our dates, about um, September 6th through the 8th is when we transplanted. And then our first flower harvest was September 25th. So you can see that's uh, less than three weeks. So when you know we talk about a, a pretty or exactly three weeks, that's a pretty quick turnaround to get your first harvest, which um, may really appeal to growers, right? And then the other interesting thing that these flowers were a lot, um, the many of the flowers were much more cold hardy than I had anticipated. So we still had decent flowers December fourth. That was really we called it at that point. So. Um, you know, they, as Alexis mentioned, these were fall colored flowers. So really up into Thanksgiving was kind of our goal. Um, so that was anything after that was kind of like, okay, we're just curious. Um, you may not have a market for those flowers after Thanksgiving, just given people are wanting Christmas stuff. So um, same thing, Breathitt County was just a few days before us for their last harvest. So here's the methods. So the research tunnels were 15 feet wide and 44 feet long. And here's an example of one, right? Um, three rows with about 40 feet of that planted with tomatoes, 26 plants per row. Um, the rows were three feet wide, three feet apart. And in row spacing of tomato plants was 1.5 feet. Um, BHN 589 was used in all the tunnels. Um, it's just a really reliable hybrid. Um, and then the Florida weave, we didn't, you know, we didn't do, this was just like standard tomato production, right? We didn't use anything too crazy, uh, Florida weave. And then we put uh, posts for trellising every two plants, right? And then did the Florida weave. So very basic, you know, very standard tomato production, nothing crazy. Um, I will point out, um, in K that these sticky cards are up and you will hear more about these um, in the next presentation. So this is, you know, talking about um, scouting and, and pest management. These sticky cards were um, instrumental in that. And so in both Lexington and Breathitt County, there were two tunnels and there was a high input tunnel, what we call the high input tunnel and the low input tunnel. In reality, the low input tunnel was more of a moderate input tunnel. Um, so we weren't, you know, we weren't, the plants weren't, um, there wasn't a deficit of anything by any means, but, and you can see more about our, what our recommended rates are, um, at UK. If you look at ID 36, it's the commercial vegetable growers guide, um, for university of Kentucky. So thinking, and, th and then I'm just gonna run through real quick the differences here. So pre-plant fertilizer was the same for both. Um, Post-plant fertilizer though was, was fertigated through the drip lines. And we were looking at, a, this was a weekly fertigation in the high input tunnel. And it was at a rate, you know, over the course of the season, a rate of hundred pounds of nitrogen per acre versus the moderate input ended up being about every two weeks. And it was, roughly 75 pounds of nitrogen per acre right over the course of the season. So, um, and then the other aspect of it being low and high was the applications of pesticides, which you'll hear more about. Um, but just to break this down, so this, basically our high input tunnel was if you were a very, you know, anal retentive grower and you, you know, like clockwork you had you kept your schedule so we did about pretty much every 10 days a uh, preventative fungicide application and then insecticides were applied based on scouting the low input was really only when thresholds were met so disease or insect thresholds um, indicated that we needed to apply so not preventative applications only you know once we saw a problem and so you can see that would really time and labor wise, the difference between these two would really add up. So uh, here's the tomato production. So for Lexington, there were 21 total tomato harvests and our marketable weight in the high input was um, about 1600 pounds. 
um, versus the low input was just under 1400 pounds. Um, and then a marketable count, 2600 versus 2300, unmarketable um, was pretty close, but then you can see the, the count, right? So a lot of our unmarketables were really small. And here's a, you know, a whole list of reasons for what we considered unmarketable. And I would say that you know, a lot of, I know a lot of Kentucky growers um, will do like canning tomatoes. So tomatoes that are not um, terribly high quality, you know, right? They're kind of, they're still decent enough to eat, but they don't look good. And so they'll sell them very cheap in a big box. And so we did not take that into account. So it's very possible that our unmarketables could have been much lower if we were thinking about what, what we call canners, right? Um, so peak harvest um, was July 16th with 355 pounds. And that's in a 15 by 44 uh, foot tunnel. And there was a five, over 500 tomatoes um, versus the low input, the peak harvest was July 13th. The most unmarketable date, I didn't know how to phrase that, right? The, the worst harvest date maybe um, was July 13th. This had the most in any one day of unmarketable versus August 24th in the low input. So things really started to go downhill at the end of the summer, which is not unexpected, right? So first harvest date and last harvest date. Um, Sean, do you wanna real quick, um, just talk just briefly about your highs and lows um, in Breathitt County, just to give people an idea. Um, and so the tunnels were managed as 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 identically as we could we could deal with, right, Sean? Yep, absolutely. Um, for us over here, um, total harvest pounds in our high input tunnel was thirteen hundred and seventy two pounds. Uh, in the low input tunnel, it was 1,524 pounds. So uh, greater yield in pounds in our low input tunnel. Uh, fruit numbers were pretty close. We had 3,494 tomatoes in the low input and 3,187 in the high input tunnel. So uh, kind of unusually, we had better yields from our low input tunnel than from our high input tunnel. I will mention here now, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Goche will talk about this, but uh, we were fighting southern blight in our tunnels and things, so we kept losing plants over the course of the season, which may have had some effect on that. Our uh, first harvest uh, was uh, actually some green tomatoes from one of the plants that uh, collapsed on us over a weekend of uh, June 22nd. And then the first harvest of ripe tomatoes was June 28th in both tunnels. Final harvest was August 7th. Uh, and our peak harvest time was uh, the week of July 14th to the 18th. Um, we were kind of stretched for labor over here. So our labor, our harvest sometimes stretched over a day or two, uh, just harvesting that just because we were shorthanded and things, but it was the same in both tunnels that mid-July, uh, July 14th to the 18th was our peak harvest in both tunnels. Okay. Yeah, I saw that yours, uh, interestingly enough, your, your, low, uh, your low input tunnel had a higher marketable weight. And yeah, that, I guess that was attributable to disease. Uh, possibly. Uh, we'll, we'll see what Nicole thinks about that. Uh, we, we were also fighting uh, pests. Uh, we had, you know, not real high levels. Uh, Jonathan and Katie might mention what they saw here and things. I think our insect levels were pretty much uniform across the uh, two tunnels and things. Um, late in the season, uh, I should mention our high input tunnel was right next to a hemp field. So I think we had a little bit of insect pressure coming in from our uh, hemp fields and things that might have affected somewhat our yields in our high input tunnel as well. Okay. Um, and yeah, so we had about 21 total harvest and it ended up being 
uh, about at the, in the peak of summer, we were harvesting three times a week in order to just keep up with things. And I think that's about, you know, for peak tomato season, that's pretty standard. Okay, so here's a seasonal perspective of, you know, kind of just a snapshot of what things look like throughout the season. So yeah, you can see the peak, right, of marketable pounds, and then, um, you know, total, uh, should be just total pounds, you know, over the course of the um, season, right? And then this just gives you an idea of what our plants looked like. Here's the Florida weave. So we had pretty tight, you know, there was a lot, um, you know, this is like maybe six inches apart. So things were really tightly um, held up, you know, not a lot of sagging. Um, of course, and then of course you have to move the sticky cards as the plants grow. So it's uh, basically at the end of the season, the sticky cards could not, we could not move them any further up to get away from the plants. So, and we did see, um, I can't find the photo, but the high input tunnel was, the plants were obviously taller in the high input tunnel than they were in the low input tunnel by, you know, probably uh, six inches to a foot, honestly. Um, so here's just another snapshot of the rotation as we move into the flowers. So here's uh, the, this hopefully will give you a little bit better idea of what the, the flower layout was. And here's the list of flower varieties that we used. So again, same tunnels. Um, so really, I, you know, the, the tomatoes went out, we took a week to renovate the tunnels and then the flowers go in, right? So it was a really quick turnaround, which, which may be hard for, for, for growers to, to do that quick turnaround um, if you've got other tunnels or other things going on. And so again, these, this, we had more sticky cards to kind of evaluate things. And then the other thing I'll say is the sunflowers here were planted in one week um, successions. So um, to try to see, you know, kind of looking at planting dates real quick, that kind of thing. Um, and so here's what that looks like in real life, right? So sunflowers down in the middle, and then the transplanted flowers on the outsides. So and here's a another a little better photo of that kind of explaining the layout of things. So uh, close up photos of what things looked like and what was what. So um, the, the lime and the queen red and the red spike amaranth and the coral fountain. So as you can see, yeah, very nice kind of fall influenced colors. And so our methods, again, we had three rows. Um, so there were all flowers were tra all flowers transplanted except for sunflowers. So the sunflowers were direct seeded. So those transplanted flowers, it worked out to be about 32 flowers per foot or per five feet. And then the sunflowers were direct seeded six inches apart. Um, so there was apical bud pinching in half of both tunnels, half of all the tunnels. And so the, the reason for apical bud pinching is um, it <clears throat> increases branching and leads to more blooms. Um, and then it leads to also helps with the smaller diameter stems. So that's particularly helpful with things like amaranth that can get really thick stems. And so um, we have several videos, um, one video that goes into explaining how to do this, this apical bud pinching, and then also flower harvesting, how to do that appropriately. And then also um, bouquet creation, which I'll, I'll give you the link to those things at the end. So there were three fertilization events. So as you can probably, you're probably picking up here, much more straightforward than tomato, much less um, fertilizer in general uh, than tomato. Um, and so in the transplanted beds, there were two lines of drip tape. And in the sunflower bed, there were three lines of drip tape. Um, and then we use this Hort Nova netting, which I'll show you a close up. Um, the other thing to keep that to keep in mind, of course, is that um, right as we're going into fall, row cover becomes necessary again. So um, we got creative 
in with how to do this and basically you know lots of clothespins were involved but we tried to treat it like one big sheet um, the one thing i will say is that this is definitely a two-person job so um, hopefully people have help if they if they try this at home um, so again here's the the um the three fertilization points so at planting fertigation uh, when the plants are 10 inches tall and four to six weeks before final harvest so um, just a little at the beginning then you put a little more and then you put the rest of it there so and here we're here's what we used and again um 11 applications versus four right so the high input was you know every week every 10 days applying a fungicide application. Um, we did see a lot of powdery mildew on the zinnias, which is not terribly unusual, but um, it did get pretty, pretty bad in there. And then here we go with the high versus low input flowers. So um, you, this is a big table. I see that, <laughs> you know, it's a little overwhelming, but what I do want you to see is that, first of all, we got no pro cut reds. Like we got one at the very end of the season and I really wouldn't count it, which is why I didn't put it in here. So none um, in Lexington, this is, these are Lexington numbers. So, um, but you can see here, the stems for low and high input are, you know, there's, I don't know, 70, 70 stems difference. Um, but, uh, you know, you can see that, um what we didn't do so well at so straw flower did not have a lot of harvest um we did have a lot of what we did harvest was marketable but just wasn't a lot to begin with um and then right the amaranth there was a lot there was a lot of cosmo and zinnia um and i will say that really we only were able to harvest from the most of almost all of the first um week the first planting of sunflower and a few of the second week and none of the third week. So that showed us, right, we, we it was too late at that point, like, so not a good planting date, right? Third week of September for us. And so um, marketable stems, what we considered marketable was no shorter than 12 inches. Um, we're, we're, we're aiming at about pencil width, except for sunflowers and amaranth, which would be thicker than that. Um, and so also blooms had to be perfect, you know, no damage at all is acceptable. And so I think for people, it really depends. So we were kind of um, looking at this as if you were gonna sell to a florist. Um, I think certain things you probably could be a little bit more lenient on and maybe have more marketable, what you would consider marketable flowers if you were um, creating bouquets uh, for a farmer's market. Um, certainly, you know, if the blooms are damaged or something like that, no, but maybe if a stem is a little too short or a little too thick or a little too thin, right, you could, you can get away with it and your customer wouldn't care, right? So, and then we looked at soil um, fertility over time. So unfortunately, this, this one was not available, but you can see that, you know, phosphorus goes down over time. Um, so does potassium. Uh, magnesium, oddly enough, does not, even though we didn't apply magnesium. But this again goes into that, you know, no leaching effect of high tunnels. Um, the pH stayed really moderated, which was nice, and organic matter um, went up. So um, nitrogen, though, there wasn't a huge difference. It actually went up. And so this kind of makes me wonder if we could get away with applying perhaps less nitrogen um, overall, right? Um, so, so challenges, right? So there was this, what we use this Hortnova netting um, on all the transplanted flower, on all the flowers actually. And so it grows up and it helps keep the flowers stable. So it was pretty genius and Alexis helped us with this, um, but it is not for the clumsy. Um, you could easily injure yourself. So as you can see, it looks like basically a volleyball net. That's pretty much what it is. It kind of almost that same material too. It's a little thinner. It was a little tricky to put into place, but once it's there, 
it's easy. So you kind of, you can slide it up. So like with the case of the sunflowers, you just slide it up as the flowers grow, right? So there's not repeated trellising like there would be with tomatoes. Um, the row cover that off and on, off and on, off and on, that was tricky. Um, so row cover for flowers should go on around um, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So once, um, you know, once you get into those temperatures, you need to put row cover on. Um, and so you can see these were damaged despite having row cover, the zinnias did get cold damage. And we saw our, I think our first frost date was like October 20 something. I, I've forgotten the date, but so, you know, it's pretty early um, on, um, but most, you can see the, the sunflowers are totally unaffected and most everything else was basically unaffected. The zinnias did not like it. Um, the sticky cards and the row cover do not mix well. So we, we had a lot of trouble trying to keep the sticky cards in place, which um, your average grower would not be worried too much about that. They may have a, just a couple sticky cards in place. And then, you know, grading, grading and sorting tomatoes is time consuming, and, but also grading and sorting flowers is very time consuming and really looking at them and evaluating them. Um, we found that to be pretty a uh, pretty lengthy process. So considerations. So um, planting tomatoes early can lead to some challenges with handling the row cover while also trying to trellis. So you can see here, this is what we ended up doing, which looks really cool, but again, it's very time consuming. Um, the row cover, what we found was the row cover weighed on the sunflowers and caused this curved stem. So I would imagine, and maybe Alexis can weigh in on this, that, you know, for a florist, they probably would say, no, thank you um, on this curved stem. But, um, you know, if, again, if you're just doing this for a market um, bouquets at a farmer's market, it probably would be okay. Um, but that, uh, that was, I found that to be interesting. The row cover was pretty heavy on the sunflowers. It didn't break anything as long as we were careful, but um, it did lead to some, lead to some curb stems. And then the, the timing. So I guess if I were to do this again, I would plant at least one to two weeks earlier, which would put us in the third or fourth week of August. So <clears throat> we are in the process of applying for a grant to do some more work on this. And you know, so evaluating different planting dates <clears throat> in different locations across the state, evaluating um, different cultivars and different flower species. And then also, you know, this thought of, could we get, get away with applying less fertilizer to the flowers at following tomatoes? Um, so here are some resources. So this YouTube channel has three videos, um, flower pinching, flower harvesting, and bouquet creation, all starring Alexis Sheffield. Um, and then also the Veg Crops website has, you know, events, um, resources, and that, and the like. And then I did mention ID 36, and then of course ID 235.